Hey, uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Coleman Krasik. I'm from a research software engineer at the University of Portsmouth. Uh, while I've been there, I, I've been working as a developer with the Zooniverse Citizen Science Project. So today I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Zooniverse and then give a work through about how to create your own Zooniverse project in hopefully 15 minutes. So a quick, uh, before we begin, I just want to take a quick survey in the room. Hands up, how many people have heard of the Zooniverse before? Okay, that's about half of the room. So I'm just gonna start with a quick explanation about what the Zooniverse is and a little bit of the history of the project. So the Zooniverse is the world's leading citizen science uh, website. It started in the year 2007 with the project called Galaxy Zoo. Uh, since then, it's grown to be much bigger. Uh, there's been over 680 million classifications made by volunteers around the world. Uh, we've had over 300 projects successfully launched on the system. Uh, and we have um, a volunteer base of over two and a half million people registered around the world to help with these projects. Uh, during that time, uh, researchers have written over 420 research papers around data that's either come from the Zooniverse or data related to Zooniverse projects. So there's been several meta studies looking at the communities that have sprung up around these projects as well. So, Here's what the Zooniverse looked like back in 2007. So this is Galaxy Zoo 1. Uh, during that time, a new telescope came online in astronomy called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. This was one of the first times in astronomy where there was way too much data coming through for any one person to look through all of the images. So in the, in the past, the way that astronomers uh, do their research, at least with galaxies, is we want to know the morphology of the galaxy, basically what shape is it. This is something that you don't need a lot of training to understand. You can train someone in about 10 minutes to tell the difference between the various types of galaxies. So you would usually train up some postdocs and some undergrads and let them sit in a room for a few weeks to classify your entire data set. But with the SDSS, we had over a million galaxy images to go through and the postdocs became very upset about giving this a very boring task. So they decided to make a website, show the pictures to the general public, and do a little bit of training and have volunteers come and help classify the data. This is the website that they came up with. So Galaxy Zoo originally had one question with six possible answers, whether the galaxy is a spiral galaxy with clockwise rotation, anti-clockwise rotation, or if it was at John if it was an elliptical galaxy, so it looks like a fuzzy blob, if it was several merging galaxies, or if it was just a star artifact and it was f wrongly flagged up by the pipeline as a galaxy. Uh, it ran for a couple of years, and in that time, to collect a bunch of information, they decided to get 40 classifications for every single galaxy uh, within the system. Uh, and the entire thing they set up with 900,000 galaxies, and they went through all of that data. Uh, the project was significantly more su successful than they were planning, and they crashed the university server in about an hour of launching the site. Uh, after getting it back online, they built a little bit of more of a robust system, and it ran fairly well for a couple of years. At that point, they realized after doing their first few papers and their first few studies, they wanted even more information, and you could train the volunteers quite well to do even more complex tasks. So one of the big open questions was, can lay people even give reasonable information? And the answer was, yes, yes you can. So what they did is they created Galaxy Zoo 2. So instead of just a single question, they had an entire question tree that branched depending on what answer you gave. So here's just a graphic showing what the Galaxy Zoo question tree ended up looking like. And over the course of a year, they took 300,000 galax 300, galaxies from Galaxy Zoo 1, so it's the same data set, to get even more information about them. So they took some of the most interesting ones they wanted to know more information. And again, they collected 40 classifications for each of these galaxies. Then uh, they decided to get even more complex with the data and the questions that they asked, and they took some Hubble data, which is higher resolution than the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. With that higher resolution, you can ask even more detailed questions about the makeup of the galaxy. This ran for a couple of years with 120,000 galaxy images. And then they realized we have a whole bunch of galaxy data and we need to have a whole bunch of question trees that are specific to each of those data sets. 
So we need a unified back end. So each of the you know, first three versions of Galaxy were a custom web app with its own back end, its own bespoke database. But with Galaxy Z4, they decided to make a slightly more generalized system where they could enter in any workflow that they wanted, so any question tree, upload any data set that they wanted, and update that over time. And over the lifetime of Galaxy Z4, there was five separate data sets that ran through. Collectively, it was 600,000 galaxies. This ran for about six years. And this is around this time, the Galaxy, or Galaxy Zoo expanded into the Zooniverse and uh, started building other citizen science projects using the same backend infrastructure for the database. This brings us to what Galaxy Zoo looks like today, which is the fifth iteration of the project. So we uh, built this version in 2018. And the nice thing about the current iteration is this is built using the tools I'm going to show you in a couple of minutes of how you can build your own project like this. So all of this was done in browser by the research team, not the development team. Uh, right now, we have 328,000 galaxies live on the project, uh, but that's just what's live right now. Uh, since 2018, we've had about four or five different data sets of a similar size that have gone through the system. And this project you know, started in 2007, and today we are still collecting about 6,000 classifications every single day on this project. So the general public still loves doing this task. Again, we're still collecting 40 classifications for each of the galaxies, but we realize at the moment that's probably over classifying a lot of it and we could do a little bit better. And towards that end, we started implementing some machine learning on the back end where the machine T tries to find what is the quote unquote most useful image to show to the volunteers. So this isn't just like what's the most complex or what does the computer not know. This is actually trained in a way so the computer figures out if I had the answer to this, I would learn this much better. So it's trying to optimize the order in which the galaxies are shown to the volunteers. We also have a mobile version of the project. Uh, this launched in 2019. Uh, this is a much simpl more simplified version. So this is just one question if the galaxy is smooth or featured, and it has a simple swipe right, swipe left interface uh, that you can use to quickly go through your galaxies. This also collects about 6,000 classifications uh, daily. Um, and this helps um, basically identify so what might be some good galaxies to then show for further classification. So if it's smooth, then we know there's not much inf information to be gained from showing that to more volunteers, but if it's featured, then that might be something interesting to throw into the pipeline to show to more people and get further detailed classifications. As I said, Galaxy Zoo, or Galaxy Zoo and the Zooniverse has grown beyond just the space sciences. So here's a chart showing the various projects are the number of projects that have launched in the various fields over time. So it started with one project back in 2007, but since then the number has grown significantly larger. There's been over 300 projects covering space sciences, ecology, humanities, natural life sciences, uh, biology and medicine, and many others. And at the moment we're launching approximately one new project every single week on the platform. So this brings us to the meat of this presentation. How do you build your own project? So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the project builder. So just so you have some terminology, uh, our backend system is named Panoptes. Uh, there was a clever reason for that. I forget what it was at this point. Uh, but in 2014, we launched uh, this new backend and this is a unified uh, API that all of the projects uh, live on. So this contains all of the subject sets that you upload, all of the workflows that you set together, uh, and all of the projects that are created all sit within this single database structure with a unified uh, public API. Uh, alongside that back end, we also have a unified front end interface, which is the website itself. So you can go to zooniverse.org, uh, you see the front end. And this allows or has tools built in that allow you to build your own projects directly in the web interface. And at the moment, all projects on the Zooniverse run on this one unified system. So let's take a look at that system. So let's move over to Zooniverse.org. So I'm gonna maximize my browser here. Uh, so I'm uh, currently logged into my account, so this is what my landing page looks like. 
uh, when you uh, first log on to the Zooniverse, uh, you want to create an account. Uh, accounts are completely free. Uh, anyone can build a project. There's no cost associated with that. So feel free to follow along if you want. But what we're going to do after you're logged in is click this nice big build a project button. This brings us uh, to uh, your projects page. Uh, you can see I've done this uh, talk several times, so today's gonna be test number seven project. Uh, here, you can create a new project, but you also have some how-to guides and some glossaries and there are various policies that you can look through. Uh, the how-to guide is a, basically what I'm gonna be going through today. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all of this, but in detail, you can quickly see uh, what is available and what various things you can do with the project builder. But here, we're going to create the new project. We're gonna give it a name, so this is gonna be uh, test seven. Uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna leave this as a short description and a more detailed description. We create the project. Here, you can go and upload an avatar and a background image for the project. I'm just gonna leave them blank for the moment, uh, just so we can go through this fairly quickly. You can fill more information about your project, your workflow descriptions, a quote from the researcher, uh, add various tags to say what type of project it is, whether it's like space-based, humanities-based, things like that. Uh, you can go to the About page and fill in uh, several different things. So you can talk about the research that your project's uh, aiming to look at, uh, say a little bit more about your team. Uh, when you have results for the project, you include those directly on the page. Uh, an education section, if you have any outreach and education connections for the project and an FAQ page. All of these support Markdown that you can just type right into the browser and it'll save uh, to, to your project. But let's get to the meat of this and let's start creating what we call a workflow. So this is the sets of questions that you're gonna be asking the volunteers when they come to your project. So looking at the workflow, we're gonna create a new workflow and we'll just call this um, CATS. You'll see why I'm calling it that here in a second. And then we can add a task. So there are several different task types that are available. Uh, the four basic ones are a question task where you're just asking a simple question with multiple choice answers. Those can either be a single answer or multiple answer, uh, depending on what your uh, question is. Drawing tasks, if you want volunteers to draw on the image and do some type of like uh, segmentation uh, task or identifying various features. A uh, free text box if you want them to type things uh, about the project or about the subject that they're looking at. And a survey task, which is, uh, I'll show an example of it later, but essentially if you have like a camera trap ecology project, uh, you're gonna have to, or you usually ask volunteers to identify what animals in the image. So you want them to choose from maybe up to 40 different options. So it's kind of like a multiple choice question with a whole bunch of options associated with it. We're just gonna do a simple question task up front. Uh, here we'll enter the question and we're gonna ask, is it cute? This will make sense here in a second. Uh, we can add answers to this. So we're gonna have two answers, yes, and a second answer, no. Now we're gonna add a second task and this time we're gonna do a drawing task. So here we'll explain what do we want them to draw. We'll say, mark the ears, and then we identify what type of drawing tool we want them to use. So here I'm just gonna do the default point, and let's make it yellow. Um, and we'll just have it be a large point. Uh, you can have many different drawing tasks, so if you also wanted to add, say, like a circle drawing task to draw around something else, you can add those as long, or you can have multiple point tools with different colors that are for different things. But here we're just gonna have the one and we're gonna name it ears, or ear. There we go. And now we have to hook up the two questions together. So we will go back to that first question in the workflow. And we'll say, if they answer yes, move on to mark the ears. And if they answer no, submit the classification and load the next subject. That's basically end the workflow. And then if we go to the drawing task, we can also mark, see what the next task is gonna be. Here, we're gonna set this to also end the workflow. Uh, that's pretty much everything set up for a very simple project. Now we need to add some subjects. Now, I haven't uploaded any subjects to this data, or to this project yet, so I have this big button that says add an example subject set. I'm just gonna do this today uh, for time purposes. So I'm just gonna add the example subject set. 
and then put a check mark next to that, and it is a subject set of kittens. So here, uh, we just uh, sub, uh, linking it to the workflow. So you can have multiple subject sets within your project. They can go and link up to any uh, multitude of workflows that you have on your project. Uh, so here, we just have the one workflow, but you can have multiple of them. And here's our one subject set. So if we look into it, we can get a preview of some of the images that we're about to see. And these have been uploaded with a little bit of metadata, so there's some information about where these images came from in the first place, and in this case, what license uh, these images fall under. Uh, if you want to upload your own subject set, you can create a new subject set and either use the web interface to upload the images, uh, or we have uh, linked above is some command line uh, tools. Uh, so if you have about 100 or so images, uh, you're fine using the web interface. As soon as you get into the 500 to 1,000 images, you're probably gonna wanna move to the command line tools. Uh, these tools are written in a way that is uh, rerunnable, so if your internet connection uh, decides to stop working, you can actually resume where you left off without having uh, duplicate subjects uh, re-uploaded to the project. And it'll also do some retrying, so it'll retry uploading five times and automatically restart uh, if things go wrong. Uh, when you upload the data, you can also include uh, the metadata that goes alongside the subjects. Uh, this is constructed inside of a simple CSV file. Uh, so here's where you'd want to put information that would link the uh, subjects back with some type of ID number within uh, your research project. So, uh, when you upload it to the Zooniverse, every subject's given a unique ID number, and that's the one that's gonna be in your data exports. So you usually wanna include in your metadata some way you can match that back to uh, the original catalog that the images came from. So now that we have a subject set, we have some workflows, we can just go straight up to this view project button, and we have ourselves a Zooniverse project. So here we can now see uh, test seven, is the very creative name I've given this project, our very short description up front. Uh, if we had a researcher quote, it would be down below. This is the more in-depth information. And here we can just click get started and jump directly into our workflow. So we have uh, presented with our first question of is it cute? Yes, this cat is very cute. And then we have our drawing task of marking any ears that are present where we can just draw it, hit the done button, and then move on to the next image of a cat. So you can very quickly create some workflows, get your data into a project and prototype what you want your, the volunteers to see. Um, and that took me about 15 minutes. It is just that easy. So now uh, some other things to note about uh, the project is if you have collaborators, so you're probably not building this project alone, you're probably building it in a team. Here you can add collaborators to your project. Uh, so if you have their Zooniverse username, you can add them to the project in, at several different levels. So collaborators have full edit access to the project. Testers would only be able to classify on the project. Um, we also have uh, talk forum boards that go alongside every single project. So here I'm just gonna activate the talk boards. So if we come to our project here, let's just refresh the page and go through one more classification. Now, there are no ears visible in this one. I can click this talk button, and what this does is it brings me to a forum board as, about this specific image. So if I wanted, as a volunteer, to say, hey, I noticed something interesting in this image that wasn't in the tasks that you asked, this is where they have the opportunity to do this. Uh, within Galaxy Zoo, this is where the most interesting science actually happened. It was in the things we didn't even know we wanted to ask the volunteers, things we didn't even know were in the data set that someone flagged up of, hey, what is this interesting thing off to the side? What is this little green blob? And that's you know, something that you don't usually get with traditional like machine learning techniques. It's a serendipitous discovery that you really need human eyes on your subjects to really find. But with a forum board also comes the need to moderate them. Uh, so that's why within our collaborators roles, we have the ability to add moderators to, our, to projects. These are people who can go through, moderate the forum boards, uh, ban people if necessary, delete messages, that, that, those, thing, those types of things. 
Uh, every project is responsible for moderating their own talk boards, so that's something that it falls on the research teams when they build up their project. So if this is something you're interested in using, that's a time consideration you also want to factor into uh, the work that goes along using one of these uh, projects. Uh, there's the ability to add tutorials and upload field guides and other various information. Uh, but the last thing I want to cover uh, within the interface at the moment is the topic of visibility. So there are several different uh, options that you can see here. So there's private versus public. A private project is only accessible by collaborators or people who've been added on the collaborator tab. So even if someone got a link to your project, if their username wasn't linked to your project, they wouldn't even be able to see it. So if you want to do a project that's just within your collaboration, so a small team of say five people, and you have some very you know, specific, you know, domain specific tasks that you're doing, a little more complex than uh, something you'd show the general public, you can still use the interface uh, in this private mode and still uh, have or use this nice web interface for classifying your subjects. Public, if you switch it to public, anyone with the link will be able to get to the project. Uh, this does not mean that it's viewable, uh, you know, for example, on the Zooniverse's uh, main page, if we go to the projects page, it does not become visible on the private projects page, but it does become visible for anyone who has the link. So say you want to do something that is you know, a smaller community, so in your local area, you have a small project, uh, and you just want to do your own advertising for the project, you don't want to make uh, use of a fully launched Zooniverse project, you can just make it public and pass the link around as you want. Uh, and the two modes down here, development versus live, uh, these set ha what happens to the subjects after they're classified. So one of the things uh, when you look at your uh, workflow, Let's go quickly back into the workflow. Down here at the bottom, we have uh, what's called a retirement limit. This is how many views for that subject have to happen before uh, the subject is removed from the system. So basically, at what point do you retire the image and don't show it to any new volunteers? Uh, we default it to 15, but you need to set this uh, based on you know, the type of task that you're asking. More complex tasks usually need more people to look at them than simpler tasks. So uh, that leads us to back in the visibility. In development mode, no subjects will retire. So that means uh, you have the ability to edit your workflows freely and no, no data will retire from the system. Once you switch a project to live, I'm just gonna switch it back to private real quick. Once you switch a project to live, that locks down your workflows. You can no longer edit them and it turns on retirement. So if once a subject reaches a retirement limit, it will be removed from the system. Now, if you want to, uh, if you have built up your project and you want to take it live and have anyone within uh, any of the Zooniverse volunteers be able to find your project and classify on it, you can go through uh, this apply for review button. So once you've uh, met all the requirements listed uh, above this, you can apply for review. Uh, what this does is it sends your project to our beta testers. So beta testers are just volunteers who have signed up to be a beta tester. Uh, they get about five uh, test projects every week to look through. Uh, they ask to classify on the project, look through the about page, and then fill out a short survey using a Google form that tells, uh, to tell us some feedback about their experience with the project. All of this is passed back to the research team that built the project, so any questions that have come up, they can iterate on and fix up. Um, so say if their workflow was extra confusing or things that the volunteers didn't quite understand, they can uh, iterate on those. And we also ask the volunteers at the end, does this, you know, does this fit a Zooniverse, you know, does this fit the type, or does this look like an appropriate Zooniverse project? So we actually crowdsource to some extent what volunteers want to see on the site, and it's not just what the Zooniverse team deems should be on the site. Uh, that entire beta review process, uh, it can be a little bit lengthy to get into it, so if you apply for review, it can take up to three to four weeks before uh, your project is passed to the beta testers, and uh, after that, it usually takes about a week or two for uh, you to collect some classifications from the project at that point, you can test to see if your data analysis pipeline works, 
try to identify what a good retirement limit is and various things like that. Uh, but once it's passed the beta review, then it's fully launched on the system and it appears in this projects list for anyone who comes on to the Zooniverse to look at and classify on. So that's building a Zooniverse, or building a Zooniverse project. So I'm just gonna quickly go back to my slides. Uh, so I'm just gonna show some example projects to see, show you what various things uh, people have been doing with the Zooniverse. So here's just a screenshot. Yeah, you saw this earlier. This is the current landing page as of last week. So you can see there's 101 live projects at the moment uh, on the system. Uh, here's one that I thought was pretty interesting, the Jovian Vortex Hunters. This is looking at pictures of the atmosphere of Jupiter, and they're asking the volunteers to use an ellipse tool to mark the vortices uh, within the atmosphere. And they have a different ellipse tool for each color of the vortex. Uh, then there's, here's an example of what a camera trap project looks like or something that uses the survey tool. So this is um, the Wild Southwest. So they have a ca camera trap set, set up in the southwest of the US. And as you can see, a survey task essentially shows uh, pictures associated with you know, a bunch of animals that could be in this image. Uh, and there's actually some filters where you can do things like if the horns are this shape, then it's this set of animals. If the pattern is stripy, it's this set of animals, and you can have some filters to help people narrow down if they don't know the exact name of a species of animal. And one of my favorite projects on the website is Penguin Watch. So in this project, volunteers are asked to identify the location of penguins in time-lapse images. Uh, these are camera traps that are sent, set up in the Antarctic. Uh, so here you can see uh, what the interface looks like. We have a bunch of penguins, and volunteers are asked to use a point tool to click on them. So I did a, a lot of work to help with the data analysis for this project. So this is one of the things uh, that I did within my RSE role. Um, and the uh, PIs of the project were kind enough to take me down to Antarctica with them in 2019. So here's a picture of me with some penguins in the background. Uh, so that was essentially a glorified trip to change out a bunch of SD cards and collect a bunch of penguin poop. Uh, and another uh, one of my favorite projects on the site is anti-slavery manuscripts. So this project is, was unique in our system because it's the first time we uh, built a project for collaborative, uh, uh, for volunteers to work in a collaborative way uh, when uh, viewing the subjects, essentially. So here we had a bunch of handwritten letters from the Civil War era within the US, and they wanted all of these letters to be transcribed. So typically, previous transcription tasks would have every single volunteer work independently on transcribing the page. So you would have you know, 10 or 15 independent transcriptions of every single page that you'd have to figure out how to then uh, collate that information and find a consensus text. Uh, for anti-slavery manuscripts, uh, we decided to do something a little more complex. So in this one, uh, we have the volunteers uh, underline each line of text and then type what they see. If they're the first person to come along and do this, then they can underline and just use the free type, uh, text box. But if someone else has already classified the image, they will, this will be pre-populated with the lines that they've drawn. And when you click on each line, you'll see what each person typed for that line. So in that drop-down list, you can either agree with a previous classification you can edit a previous classification or just type in a whole new transcription yourself. And once that is submitted, it's uh, immediately combined with all other, and aggregated together with all other classifications on that subject. So the next person who sees it gets that shown to them in the front end as well. So this has a lot of complex things going around in the background of doing live data aggregation and feeding that right back to the front end of the project. So I was involved in doing the data aggregation end of that. So that brings us to what it is I work on within the Zooniverse personally, and that is data aggregation. So the main things that I'm concerned with is after a project is run and they've collected their classifications, how do you determine consensus? So for question tasks, this can be as easy as just a majority count. Uh, for the drawing tasks, this involves various types of shape clustering so when you have a whole bunch of points or you have a whole bunch of circles, a whole bunch of ellipses, how can you combine those together? Uh, for transcription tasks or text boxes, we do some text alignment 
uh, on the data to then try to figure out what the consensus sentence is and give some type of consensus score uh, along with that. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, with things like Galaxy Zoo, we've started looking at uh, feeding the data into online machine learning models. So rather than uh, just relying on the volunteers, we have a machine working along and we have this synergy between um, the machines and the human learners within the system. Um, and also, all of this, I'm being, uh, after I do a lot of work for a specific project, I take time to generalize this into a general set of tools so that next time a project wants to come along and use the, uh, have with a similar uh, data set or a similar project, they can use the same data analysis pipeline. So all of the data and aggregation that I do is in an open source uh, project that anyone can download and install. Uh, it's Python based, uh, but there's also a command line interface for people who don't want to get into the nuts and bolts of how to write Python scripts. So anyone can come in and uh, aggregate their data and hopefully get them one step closer to the science that they want to do. So thank you. Excellent, thanks very much for that. That was really interesting. So we've, uh, Slido uh, has got quite a lot of questions on there. Okay. So um, we'll start there and... Um, okay. Uh, so, it, do you yeah. want to read them out? Or yeah, I'll read, read them out. out. So the first question is, is there a limit to the amount of data you can upload for a Zooniverse project? Uh, yes and no. Uh, so our default limit is 10,000 subjects. Uh, this is just to prevent people using us as a data storage service. Um, but if you have a legitimate research need for having more subjects, which most of our large projects do, uh, you can just contact the Zooniverse uh, through contacts or contacts at zooniverse.org and they uh, will up you know if you tell them the reason that you need to upload more subjects they can go through and upload the amount of subjects you mean up to essentially unlimited okay uh, next question uh, who sponsors uh, the zooniverse I saw that one first yep uh, so the zooniverse is grant funded uh, so we have various research grants so originally it was uh, an NSF grant, then it was the Sloan Foundation for a while. Uh, in 2014, uh, the Zooniverse was, uh, won a large grant from Google, so this was marked as one of the uh, leading, uh, or what was the words of it, one of the futures, future of the internet project award type thing. Uh, and we got a large grant from Google and uh, that's what funded uh, the Panoptes back end in general, so that's, and essentially what funded my original position within the Zooniverse. So uh, we have had various sponsors throughout, and it's mostly research grants. Uh, is there an integration with third-party backends or storage options, e.g. pulling data from the cloud, object storage, or specialist scientific databases? Um, not particularly. So all of our backend is uh, within our system. Uh, the one exception is for uh, the subject data itself. So the subjects can either be, you know, PNGs, uh, or no, I'm sorry, images, movies, or audio are the three types that we support at the moment. Uh, by default, if you upload them, they're uploaded to uh, our servers, which is a public server. So there's some data concerns around if you have private data, do you really want to be uploading it to a public server? But we also have the ability to uh, upload subjects that are linked to, to uh, hosted images. So if you have a private data set, you could host uh, the images themselves on your own web server and just link to them. And then when you log onto the Zooniverse, uh, it would just grab that from your hosted server rather from the Zooniverse servers. Um, that can be useful for if you have medical, private medical data, you can host them behind a VPN and then upload them as subjects, and if you then log on to the site, if you're not on the VPN, the subject just won't load. Uh, so you don't have to worry about the project being leaked in that type of way. Okay. Can the Zooniverse be self-hosted? Yes, it can. So all of the uh, Zooniverse uh, code is fully open source and available on GitHub. So you can spin up your own version of the back end, your own version of the front end, or any of the data uh, processing tools, so the aggregation engines and the various things associated with that. All of it can be self-hosted, so if you need to have something that is completely self-contained or you have very private data and you don't want to be dealing with VPNs and things like that, 
uh, you can fully host the entire system yourself. Or how do you handle malicious users mislabeling images in the, at this scale? Uh, that is a fun task within data aggregation. Uh, we uh, have various ways to go about this. Uh, different projects have come up with different solutions. Uh, but the basic idea is this is why you collect multiple classifications uh, across many different volunteers. Uh, you can do things called like, or we call it user weighting essentially. Uh, how well do they agree with the majority on the vote already and look at their entire history of classifications. Uh, for drawing tasks, uh, say you have like a freehand free hand drawing tool, uh, typically you're not gonna have people drawing self-intersecting objects, so a quick way of finding the person who's writing a message to the person in the computer lab next to them or drawing smiley faces or various other things. Uh, you can just quickly filter those out. Um, or you can do something even more complex that the Space Warps project did. So that was looking for gravitational lenses and it was a simple yes, no question. They did a full blown Bayesian analysis to create a confusion matrix for every single user. So if you lied on every single, and you've purposely got it wrong every single time, the machine learned to do the opposite of what you said and you just gave the same amount of information as if you did it right every single time. So in those types of systems, being 50-50 is the exact wrong thing to do. Okay. Is it difficult to get the public to engage with projects on the Zooniverse? Uh, does it depend on the project? Are some projects more popular than others? Yes, this is definitely something that we see. It's very much project by project uh, specific. Uh, we have some best practices that are uh, linked when you go in that, you know, when you start to build a project, one of the buttons is best practices. Uh, within there, we try to un uh, tell you, you know, some of the best things that we've learned from the projects that have been popular. Uh, the main thing is uh, the volunteers want to interact with the research team. So being active on the talk boards, interacting with the volunteers, uh, being engaged in the community, that's what uh, volunteers like to see and those are the, the projects they tend to, you know, aggregate to. Uh, have you considered gamifying uh, this system to encourage more participation? Yes, it's a bad idea. <laughs> uh, we have done various studies on this, uh, but specifically the, what we found is the type of gamification, specifically leaderboards, is the worst thing that you can do because the volunteers uh, start competing with each other in some sense and the people at the top of the leaderboards feel more stressed and they want to stay at the top of the leaderboards, so they start classifying more quickly, and classifying more quickly means they're classifying less accurately and the entire quality of the project goes down. The types of gamification that have worked are community challenges, so when we set like, we want to reach a thousand classifications this week on this project, then everyone rallies behind that and we see an uptick in performance on that. So the first, first things, it doesn't work so well, but there are ways that you can get around that. Uh, how do you monitor review projects for potential harm? So this is what the beta review process is. So um, we don't do any monitoring of private projects uh, explicitly, but any public projects uh, we go through and we look for um, what they're trying to do. If they apply for a beta review and it comes back that they're asking some not quite ethical questions or they don't have the license to be using the subjects that they've uploaded. Uh, we uh, re send that information back to the project teams to get a response from them uh, and typically just shut down the project completely. Um, there's been a few cases of that uh, within the Zooniverse. Um, and we also have a Zooniverse wide uh, talk boards and so not just the project talk boards uh, the Zooniverse does have a team of moderators uh, that are you know, within the community that we have watching those boards as well. Uh, so just like any other thing with a forum, we have to have moderators actively on it. How many active users are on the Zooniverse? Uh, so active users is a little more difficult. I don't have a number off the top of my head, but it's definitely at least in the tens, to thousands, tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands range. Uh, but I don't have an exact number. 
what does the output of the data look like? Is it in formats I can feed straight into a machine learning pipeline or does it need some uh, reprocessing first? So all of the data comes, uh, the data dumps come in a CSV file. Uh, the actual uh, classification data is in a single column that is stored as structured JSON. The shape of that JSON is dependent on the task type itself. Uh, but the aggregation tools uh, that I've, I've written and that are available uh, is split into two steps where the first step is an extraction phase which will take that CSV file and turn it into a flattened CSV file with very few data structures within it. And that would be a very good starting point, something to be just directly popped into a machine learning pipeline. Uh, for image annotation tasks, do you have a method uh, to average locations of objects across several user selections? Yes, we do. Uh, so this is one of the main uh, things that I was working on with the data aggregation. Uh, specifically, we use uh, data clustering and we have several different algorithms uh, available for that. So within the framework, uh, the main one we use is dbscan uh, for clustering, but we also have hdbscan, optics, and a couple other clustering methods that you can use. Um, and also, uh, because it's completely open source, if you know enough Python, you can jump in and write your own aggregation as well. So if you wanna use a specific cluster for a certain type of thing, you can go in and just add it yourself uh, within the framework. Uh, does the Zooniverse have any methods for handling paying people to do image annotations, something akin to Amazon Mechanical Turk? Yes, uh, so this is a spin-out company that the Zooniverse started about four or five years ago called 1715 Labs. So this is, uh, so the Zooniverse in general is for projects related to research and science. If there's any commercialization related to the project, it will not pass beta review. Any commercialization uh, tasks we send to 1715 Labs which is uh, more or less a private version of the Zooniverse running on their own servers uh, that ties in with Amazon Mechanical Turk's back end to handle the payment. So it's the Zooniverse front end with the Turk back end, uh, mainly because the tools for building projects on Mechanical Turk are not the best in the world. Uh, when would you use Zooniverse for helping with uh, classifications and when would you use machine learning tools? So this is a very good uh, question and something that we're trying to define uh, more clearly to try to figure out what's the best. Uh, typically, uh, machine learning, if once your subject sets start getting into the several millions, it becomes impractical to show it to uh, humans. So you usually wanna use some type of machine learning to get the subject set you know, back down to millions size. Um, but also, a lot of the things that we're uh, looking at are, you know, the humans are gonna be much better at serendipitous discovery, so that's something that machine learning isn't the best at. Um, so if you think there's stuff hidden in your data set that you aren't sure, then you probably want to at least have some portion of it look like, like people on, like, you know, on the Zooniverse platform. And machine learning for mundane things or things that would be very boring tasks. Uh, so we usually use, on Galaxy Zoo, machine learning we use to get rid of a lot of the elliptical galaxies because they're just very boring to look at. Uh, there have been any studies uh, where Zooniverse classification results are comparable to machine learning classification results on the same data set. So not really because a lot of the machine, so a lot of the data sets that we're working with, uh, at least in a, the astronomy field, and these are the ones I'm most familiar with, uh, there are no training sets. Like the whole point of the Zooniverse was to create the training set to go into the machine learning model. So at that point, the machine learning is gonna do at best exactly what the humans did, because that's what it trained on. Um, but I, I don't know any examples uh, that have gone the other direction. Uh, how do participants find Zooniverse uh, to participate? Uh, so uh, basically, uh, or how uh, advertising in general, so every time a large project goes out, uh, a lot of research teams will advertise, I've used the Zooniverse platform, or you go to zooniverse.org. Uh, within the UK, uh, you know, stars, at, or what is it, Night Sky Live, uh, the Zooniverse has a project for that uh, program every single year. And then it was uh, Autumn Watch one year, we hosted several projects. Uh, so it's been on the BBC a few times, been in the news, people have found out about it that way. 
uh, for new projects within it. If you just go to the projects landing page, you can see all the live projects and that's where most of the discovery happens. And we also have mailing lists set up so volunteers who wanna hear about new projects can get a weekly email of all the new projects that launched on the Zooniverse. Excellent. Um, so we're out of time and uh, so lunch will be served any moment now. So if we can give one last round of applause. Thank you very much, Coleman. Thank you.